everybody. Today we want to talk about the heat sector. You all know that since Russia started this war, we are all afraid that we don't get enough gas from Russia to heat our houses in winter. And of course, the heat sector is much bigger than just heating houses. A lot of the industry depends on gas supply. It's just for process heat in industry or applications where you need heat. So the heat sector is very important if you talk about the energy transition because it consumes about one third of the primary energy we are using in our society. And that's why we focus on it. And I will explain you the options for the heat sector in the example of a house because that is something which is important for everybody and everybody knows what it means to have a hot or a cold house. So let's simply go through the possible options for the future heating of a house. And we start with something very simple and we develop it step by step for getting at the end of what we call a passive house. So the most important thing at the beginning is if you want to build a house that you have a roof above your head so that you don't uh, get wet when it is raining. But that is of course not enough. You all know that sometimes outside it is too hot or too cold for you to have a pleasant living. And that's what we are talking about when we talk about heating and air condition. So the example I show you is from our area here in the middle of Europe. But of course it applies to any other place in the world, but with somewhat different outer conditions. In our area, we typically have in the summer temperatures uh, up to about 30 degrees, sometimes higher. And in the winter, it goes down to minus 10 or sometimes lower. So that is approximately the range which is important for you if you want to build a house. You should not forget that your house is on some kind of ground. And in the ground, the temperature difference between winter and summer is not really large. The deeper you go, uh, the more similar it becomes. And in our area, we have about plus 10 degrees Celsius as an almost constant temperature if you go down by a few meters in your ground. So your house becomes hot or cold from the outside air and it always becomes a little bit cold from below. To have a cozy, pleasant home, you want to have a temperature of maybe around 20 degrees Celsius depending on what you do at home. You want to have it a bit warmer or a bit colder, but this is the range you want to have. And most importantly for you is that in winter you are not freezing cold in your home. So what did the people do in the past? Well, they got an oven, later they got central heating. And in the old days, uh, the oven was fired by wood because that was available almost everywhere. And that is the simplest way to heat your house. When I was a child, my parents had an oven which was fired by coal because this was more effective and cheaper in the old days. So lignite was extracted in our area anyway. So this was the best way for heating at that time. Our neighbor had an oven which was fired by oil. This was said to be more comfortable I just remember when I went into the living room of them, it always smelled a little bit from oil. But of course, at these days, you had different attitudes concerning air quality. Today, most of the people in our area have central heating with gas because that is the cheapest and most elegant and efficient way to do it. The efficiency of these central heatings is typically a little bit above 100%. Why is it above 100% and not only 100%? Well, this is because when you burn the gas, you typically get 100% of the energy which is chemically stored in the gas converted into heat. And then in modern heatings, The water vapor, which is one of the end products of gas, uh, is being condensated in the chimney and also used for heating. And this condensation heat adds to the 100% heating by burning. And therefore, you get a nominal efficiency, which is slightly above 100% in the ideal case. One of my neighbors in my area here has wood pellets for heating. This is more sustainable and it is CO2 neutral because you use wood from the forest and in the forest you grow new wood and therefore 
this is CO2 neutral in the total cycle. This is a nice thing, but unfortunately the amount of heating energy which we need in Germany is much larger than the amount of wood we can produce in our area here. So in this sense, using wood pellets is CO2 neutral, but it is not sustainable because we don't have enough wood to cover all the needs for these many people we are having here. So the population density is too high to use wood for heating in our area here. So what to do in future? Well, the future is to have no emissions at all and to use no fuel at all and to only use the sun as primary energy. And the lecture is about how to do it. So the sun, you know, is a renewable source. The solar irradiation is almost one kilowatt per square meter, which is really a lot, but this one kilowatt per square meter you only have if the sun is shining, if there's no clouds, no fog and nothing else. So in this respect, of course, reality is much different to this one kilowatt per square meter. And especially at night, it's zero. In the winter, it's close to zero for many weeks. And in this respect, solar energy has never been thought as a possible major source for heating in the past. But today I will show you that it's still possible to use a 100% or almost 100% solar heated house. The first thing you could do is you take the cellar where you have stored your coal in the former times and you put a drum set there and then you have a lot of physical activity so that you produce a lot of heat and you are not cold anymore. But of course I'm just kidding here, the real solution looks different because not everybody is a drummer. So the main thing you have to care about if you want to build a passive house, a house which does not need any external fuels, that is that you have a very good insulation of your house. So the insulation has to be on the roof of course, but also on the walls and what many people don't realize also on the ground. So in the ideal case you have a insulation which goes once around the whole house. And this insulation helps you in summer and in winter because in winter it prevents that the heat of your house goes outside and it becomes colder and colder. And in summer it prevents that the sun which is shining on your roof heats up your house too much. So insulation is important for hot areas and also for cold areas. So here's an example of an old house which has been insulated on the right side. So on the left side you see the old bricks. On the right side you see the house with an exterior insulation finishing system. So what does this system of insulation do? So imagine your house is at 20 degrees and then you do not do any heating when it becomes colder and colder in the winter. So the amount of additional energy which you need is called Q, which you need per time and it also depends on how big your house is. So the loss through the wall or the roof is the amount of energy Q divided by time and area. And then you get a specific energy loss which you can calculate from the amount of insulation you have. So if you do the right physics then you find out that the insulation of your wall is calculated according to the formula here. It is depending on what we call the thermal conductivity of the insulating wall, which is called lambda. And this has to be divided by its thickness L and by the temperature difference between the inside and the outside of the wall. So the colder it is outside, the more energy you lose, of course. The thicker your insulation is, the less you lose and then it depends on the kind of material which you are using and this is quantified by a property of this wall which is called the thermal conductivity lambda. Here you see a few of the materials which are typically used in building houses and insulation. Uh, what most of us have are concrete walls. They have a lambda which is 2.1. The unit is watts per meter and kelvin. 2.1 is not a very good insulation if you compare it to clay 
this is 0.47 to 0.93 so it's about a factor 2 to 3 better than concrete which means the insulation is a factor of 3 better or you need a factor of 3 less heating energy to keep your house warm if instead you go to wood it's even better you have a lambda of about 0.1 to 0.2 if you go further in technology, you end up with polystyrene. Polystyrene has another factor of three better insulation properties. So you need a another factor of three less energy to heat your houses. And one of the best materials we have nowadays are vacuum insulated panels, which are a bit more expensive, but then they have another factor of 10 better properties. So by going to the right wall material and insulation material, of course, you can do a much better insulation than with the houses we build nowadays, which have typically concrete or stones, which are really not the best for insulation. And you know, the old people had wooden houses. If you look at these block houses in Scandinavia, for example, which have thick wood walls, of course, you know, you multiply this good coefficient of wood of 0.1 with the thickness of 0.1 millimeter, and you are so much better than a concrete wall uh, and then you can imagine that this was the choice of the people in the old days. So as I said, insulation works against the heat in the summer and also against the coldness in the winter. Nevertheless, the insulation of old houses is limited and the best thing you do is you put an insulation around the whole house but still the perfect insulation you only get if you build a new house which has all these features already implemented one important thing is that also below your house there's an insulation against the coldness from the ground so now you have a house which if it's warm at some time it doesn't cool down so quickly in the winter and it doesn't heat up so fast in the summer but still of course this is not enough if it is very cold for several weeks you still will be freezing cold in this house so you need a kind of heating and the best thing to do there is as i said to use solar heating the simplest way to do solar heating is if you build big windows so you need big windows in the southern area where the sun comes in and small windows on the other sides of the walls where there is no sun which could heat up the house of course if you live in new zealand or australia or somewhere else on the southern hemisphere it's the opposite way around uh, you have to have the big windows in the north but uh, you don't understand why that is the case because the sun is coming from the north there the problem with big windows in the south of course is that in summer it becomes very hot inside and um, that is also not what you want so you have to have kind of sun blinds which blocks the sunlight in the summer you can do it with blinds or with any other kind of sun protection again so that your window is in the shade so this was the next step so you have a kind of heating but then if it's very cold outside this is not enough you have to have special windows double windows if you want to really have a well insulated house double windows look about like this here you have two or three plates of glass and in between these plates there's a special gas typically argon or krypton and this gas has the property that it does not conduct heat very well and this protects that the heat from inside the house gets out or from outside the heat gets in so it's an insulation property but still the sunlight has to go in to heat up the house in the winter so it's very important that the transparency of the glass is good and the more plates you have, the less is going through. So you have to have a compromise of how many of these glasses you have. And typically it's two or three, which is optimum. So this then is already fine. It's well insulated, but then there's still one problem left, which we have to care about. And this is when there's wind blowing. If there is wind blowing and you live in an old house, you know the wind goes through the windows, through the gaps in the window and then goes out on the other side and it becomes still cold inside of your house. 
So you have to have a very airtight house if you really want to have a good insulation. And that is done by having the right windows. We have seen on the previous picture also the frame of the windows have to be very well designed so that there's no air coming through and that there's also no conductivity. If you have a metal window it's of course not a good idea because the metal conducts the heat much more than for example a wooden window. So how can you check that your house is airtight? Well there's what we call the blower door test. You put a big ventilator at your door or at one of the windows and then with this fan you produce a high or a low pressure in your house and if you have a pressure difference then the air goes through all the gaps in the house which are available. And to quantify these effects, you produce with your fan a constant pressure of typically 50 Pascal. And then if you have 50 Pascal, you just measure how much air the fan is transporting at this temperature difference. And then the formula is shown here. You calculate what is called the air changes per hour which is the airflow which goes through the ventilation divided by the volume of the house and you, if you think about it you will find out that this ratio gives you the amount of air exchanges per hour which is happening when there's a 50 pascal pressure difference. So this number has to be very small and then you have an airtight house and you can be sure that even if there's a storm outside the house keeps to be warm. So now we have solved all the problems which lead to a loss of heat to the outside of your house. But now we have a new problem because there's no air exchange anymore with the outside. The air is getting worse and worse the more people there are inside. So if you want to continue breathing in such an airtight house, you need a ventilation. And of course this is a dilemma if you look at it because if you have an air ventilation all the cold or hot air from outside comes in and all the insulation is in vain. So for that physicists have invented something very simple which is a ventilation with heat exchange. And this is a very simple idea. So you have air which has to go out of the house and it, you have to have air which goes into the house. And we need what we call a heat exchanger which takes away the heat from the outgoing air and uses it to heat up the incoming air, the incoming cold air. So this is shown here in this diagram. The easiest way to do it is the so-called counter current. So imagine it's winter, you want to get the hot air out, so you lose all the energy but at the same time you pump in cold air back to the room and while the one air is going out and the other air coming in those two are touching each other in two different pipes which are thermally conducting and then the heat of the outgoing air warms up the cold air so that at the end the temperature of the outgoing air is almost as cold as outside and the temperature of the cold incoming air is heated up to almost the same temperature of the outgoing air. So in this way you can exchange the air in your room without losing heat. And this is of course ideal for such a house because you don't lose energy this way. There's an even more elegant and or simple way to do it, which you can do if you do not want to make a big installation. You only need one hole in your wall. And in this one hole you put in what I call the cyclic storage fan. So this works the following way. You have your room on the right side and then you have a ventilation, a fan, which pushes the air outside to the cold outside. And in front of the fan there is some ceramic material which has a large heat capacity and this ceramics are heated up by the hot air which comes from your room. And then after a, one or a few more minutes the fan stops and runs the other way around. Now he takes in the cold air in winter and 
pushes it through the same ceramics which is full of holes so that the air goes through this porous material and this way the hot ceramics get cooled down by the incoming air and on the other side the air which comes in then becomes warmer. So in this respect what is done on the left picture with two in and outgoing pipes is done here with a single pipe which runs in an alternating incoming and outgoing modus. So this was the second way for an efficient air exchange without energy loss. There are more sophisticated ways where you have a central air conditioning for the whole house which is of course more comfortable if you build a new house. But this simple thing here you can install in any old house without big problems. And now our passive house is ready. So now we have a house which needs almost no heating in the winter and almost no external cooling in the summer. So you can live in such a house without needing any gas or coal or oil. Here's an example of such a house in Germany close by here. So it's a house for many families and you see the big windows on the south and there are no windows on the side visible here. So this is a passive house which works and which has been built and which is nice to live in. Of course if you live in such a passive house you have to get used that typically you don't open the window in the winter or in the summer but you use mainly your central air conditioning for changing the temperature in the house. But there's still one problem we haven't thought about and this is in case you want to take a shower. There's no heating in the house anymore so you have cold shower and this is not what you like probably. So as the next thing what do we have to add to our passive house? We have to have some additional heating and the most economic way to do it is if you put a solar thermal collector onto your roof and this produces hot water which is even in winter with a good collector you get above 100 degrees celsius if you want to so this you can use for your shower here you see a picture of the solar thermal heating which is on my own roof here at home and if you remember in lecture 22 i explained you how it works and there you can look up uh, what to do. Of course there's one more problem. If there are clouds there's no heating so you can only take a shower when the sun is shining or what you better do is you install a heat storage and the heat storage stores the heat at the time when the sun is shining for the time when there's no sun shining. And I have that in my home as well and there's a big tank of water in my cellar and this hot water is heated up from the solar collectors up to about 80-90 degrees and inside of this storage there's a heat exchanger which heats up the fresh water uh, which I can use for cooking or for having a shower and also for my heating here at home because I don't have a passive house. Details as I said are explained in lecture 22. All this looks nice but what do you do if there is a long period of coldness in the winter or if you have an old house and the insulation is not perfect then you need an additional heating. There's no way around that. And the easiest thing of course is you buy an electric heater which you plug into your electricity plug and then you have a heating but this of course is very expensive and not very ecologically correct. So you can do better than that and the better way to do it is using a heat pump. What is a heat pump? Well a heat pump has for example as shown in this diagram here a fan outside which ventilates the outside air through a heat exchanger which has a liquid and then this liquid which has then outside temperatures goes into the heat pump and this heat then at the outside temperature is then changed to different temperature. That's why you call it heat pump. You can take the heat energy which is in any material at any temperature and transfer it to a different temperature. So in winter you would increase the temperature of this heat and then use it to heat your houses. So you have a second ventilation for example in your room. 
this is one way to do it. And in summer, you run the heat pump in the opposite direction and then the heat from the inside of the room is pumped out to the outside and the room becomes colder. To really understand how a heat pump works is not so easy. For that, I have to refer you first to my lecture number 27, where I explained the Carnot machine and the Stirling engine. At that time, you might remember we had a hot coffee and there was energy in this hot coffee. And we run the Stirling engine on this hot coffee by using the temperature difference of the hot coffee and the room I'm living in. And this temperature difference was able to run a machine with a certain efficiency, the so-called Carnot efficiency, which depended on the difference of the temperature of the hot coffee and the room temperature divided by the hot coffee temperature minus the absolute zero of the universe which is minus 273.15. To really understand that, you have to learn, of course, a little bit more physics. But this is not necessary for the moment. So this is what this turning engine thing does. It produces a motion if there's a temperature difference. And the nice thing about this turning engine is you can also run it a different way around. What you do now is you turn the wheel by yourself or by an electric engine. And then these two plates on this Stirling engine, the upper and the lower plates, will have a temperature difference. And that is how a heat pump works. One of the plates becomes hot and the other one becomes cold. And this is what you can use as a heat pump to transport heat from a hot to a cold area or vice versa. Here is a nice diagram which I could explain you now in detail but which would take too long. I can refer you either to my book, which I show you at the end again, um, where this is explained, and maybe in another lecture I explain it in more detail. What you have to know for the application is the following. You have an outside temperature, in this case plus 5 degrees in winter or at night, and there's an outside fan, and the energy from outside is transferred to the liquid which is running around in this heat pump. There's a compressor which heats up the liquid to a temperature of, for example, 40 degrees Celsius. This 40 degrees Celsius you put into the room, either by a radiator or by a fan. This way the liquid which is in the pump is cooled down to room temperature. Then you have an expansion valve and this expansion valve cools down the temperature of the cooling material to, for example, minus 15 degrees, and this minus 15 degrees are then warmed up to minus 5 degrees outside, and then the circle continues. So this way you can pump the heat energy, which is in the 5 degrees Celsius cold air, into the room, and this way you transfer heat energy from outside to the inside. A bit complicated, but uh, it's just physics. For this engine now you could calculate an efficiency. People normally don't call it efficiency, they call it the coefficient of performance. And the coefficient of performance in our case then is calculated with a very similar formula to what we have used in the previous slide as the Carnot efficiency of the Stirling engine. So the formula looks like that. And if you look at it closely, it contains again temperature differences and it's basically the inverted number of the Carnot efficiency. The Carnot efficiency is always smaller than one. So this coefficient of performance is always bigger than one, which means you can produce more heat with this machine then you put in electrical power or mechanical power. So for the example here where you want to warm up a room when it's outside 5 degrees Celsius and you warm it up to 20 degrees Celsius, the ideal coefficient of performance for such a heat pump is calculated according to the formula up here where you put in these numbers and you get a ratio of 19.5 which effectively means that the efficiency of the heat pump is 1950%, which means if you put 100% electrical power in, you get 19 times as much heat energy out. So it's like producing more energy 
then you put in, but of course this is not a Papito Mobile because this energy comes from the outside. So this is the performance and from the formula you see the efficiency of the heat pumps becomes better and better the smaller the temperature differences are. So if it's only a little bit cold outside it's very efficient to use a heat pump. If it is very cold outside it becomes less efficient but still it's always better than just to have a simple electrical heating. In reality, heat pumps have efficiencies or coefficients of performance of about 300 to 500 percent, so factors of three and five more energy than electrical power you need. This is the typical uh, heat pump for the area in which I live, with the average temperatures we have here. In summer, you run the same heat pump in the opposite direction and then it doesn't produce heat, so it doesn't pump heat from outside to the inside, but it produces coldness, so it pumps out the heat from your room to the outside. And this works in a similar but opposite way. Here again, the formula for calculating the coefficients of performance and it's again a very similar formula. So you find out that if you subtract one from the coefficients of performance for the heating, you get the coefficients of performance for the cooling. In our example here now, I have chosen a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius outside. So very hot outside and you want to have 20 degrees Celsius inside. You get a factor of 19.5. So this tells you how much heat you pump out compared to the energy you put into this machine. So these heat pumps really are great devices and they are used for a long time in your fridge. So all your fridges work basically according to this principle. So all your fridges include some heat pumps. But for heating it has not been used in the past because it was too expensive and it was not really efficient when you produce your electricity from coal or from gas, uh, it doesn't make sense to use a heat pump so much because you anyway use coal and gas and there it was cheaper to use it directly at home. Today as our primary energy is electricity from renewable energies in future hopefully, then of course this is the best way to have a high performance heating at home and you can also use it as air conditioning for cooling at the same time and it uses much less energy than standard electrical heaters. As I have shown you before, the efficiency of such a heat pump depends on the temperature difference. So if it is very cold in the winter, you, need, you have a not so good performance for the heat pump. But if you think about what I told you at the beginning is that the ground temperatures are not so cold in winter. So the ground temperature is typically like 10 degrees Celsius plus. So it's much warmer than the outside air in winter and therefore the efficiency of the heat pump is much better if you use a heat exchanger which is coupled to the ground instead of a heat exchanger which uses the air as input energy. So heat exchangers which exchange heat with the ground are much better in performance, but of course they are also a bit more expensive. And there's another problem here, because if your heat pump runs at full speed, in winter it cools down the ground and the thermal conductivity of your ground is typically not so good that you can keep this 10 degrees Celsius. So after a certain time of running, the ground around the heat exchanger becomes colder and colder and at some point it's not more efficient anymore than your air exchanger. So this is the problem with these ground heat exchangers, so therefore they have to be big enough. In the next picture here I show you one of these ground heat exchangers. It's just a row of plastic pipes where this liquid from the heat pump goes through and due to the direct contact to the ground um, there's an heat exchange with the surrounding. On top of these pipes, of course, you put your ground again, like uh, one meter or so above, so that it's really below ground and the outside temperature doesn't change so much. The efficiency of these exchanges depends very much on where you live. Very important is 
the amount of rainwater going through there because the water carries the heat through. So depending on the amount of groundwater and rainwater, you have to dimension your ground heat exchanger differently. And there are some new developments which do not simply use pipes for a heat exchanger, but which have plates, radiator, like the radiators which you have in your room. And uh, along these plates also the groundwater flows and there's a much better heat exchange uh, with these big plates than with thin pipes. So these plates you put down uh, maybe two meters underground and then you would need only a rather small area for your heat exchanger. This is important for new houses because new houses typically have small gardens. So to be able to have enough heat exchange in a small garden, you should have a good heat exchanger. A lot of people call this geothermal heat, which you pump out of the ground. This is not quite the right uh, way to call it to my mind, because what is happening here is not that the geothermal heat from the core of the earth is heating up your house. In a way it does it to some extent, but not really much. If you look at the numbers, the geothermal power is about 0.08 watt per square meter. So it's very little. This is because the ground is a very good insulator and it's very difficult for the geothermal heat to go through it. If you compare it to this uh, 1400 watt per square meters, which the sun shines on our ground, of course, this is a very small number. And therefore, geothermal heat is not really efficient very much. What you do here instead is that depending on the size of your equipment in the winter you pump out the energy which is in your ground locally and in summer if you run your air conditioning you heat it up again. So the ground in this device here is mainly not a source of energy but it's like a battery it stores the summer heat and uses it for the winter this is more how you should look at it and therefore it's also very important that you have an expert who is designing that for you so he can calculate what the capacity of your ground battery is and as i said before this depends on how much groundwater there is how much flow there is and so on there are other ways to use geothermal heat. Uh, one is to have very deep drillings into the ground in an area where there is a hot ground from volcanism, for example. Uh, there you really take out the geothermal heat, but also here you have the problem if you do that over several years, it will be basically empty and you have to wait uh, a very long time, uh, several decades or so, or even longer, until this area is hot again. So in this sense, uh, deep geothermal heat is only partially renewable, uh, because you typically extract more heat than comes back from the geothermic energy inside of the Earth. Another nice thing, of course, is if you have a river close by or a lake, then you can use the heat capacity of the water of the whole lake for your heating and cooling. So if you design your heat pump, you have to choose the best option in your area. Either use a ventilation with air or a ground heat exchanger. This is already the end of my lecture. I hope you all now understood how to treat the heat sector. I did not talk uh, very much about heat exchanger and heat recovery, which is very important if you use heat for process heat. For example, in a bakery where you need to have a high temperature for baking your bread, of course, um, you can think about many ways to recover heat, like I showed you for our ventilation of our house. Also here, of course, you can recover the heat of the hot bread and of the oven uh, in, in some way so that you do not need new heat for every new bakery batch, for example. So thank you for listening. I would like to refer to my book again, which you can get for free from the internet page. And of course, have a look at the other lectures about energy and physics. 
Thank you and I hope to see you again for another lecture in future.